We do love you. Good morning, everybody. Great to see you and thankful for the time that we have together uh, in person and online. We want to welcome everybody who's a part of this. I, I, I am always encouraged as we bounce around from venue to venue or location to location um, that you guys hang with us and that uh, sometimes if you're not able to make it, I know many of you make a point of saying, hey, we are tuning in online and we are doing this, that, and the other. And so it's really, it's really great to know that you are um, following along uh, with this community and being a part of what we do together. Um, we're in the middle of a series called Take Care. We've been talking about stewarding the gifts that God has given to us, uh, taking good care of every good thing that God has blessed us with. So from taking care of our margins and our calendar to taking care of our mind or taking care of our relationships. Um, these are all things that we've talked about. Marshawn Lynch would have, would have wise word. He said, take care of mentals, take care of your mentals. And then he'd say, take care of your chicken. That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk about taking care of your money. So here, here at, at the conclusion, I'm going to have something for you um, that I'm going to, I'm going to want you to participate in. And so we did at the, at the, uh, on your way in, we were making these envelopes available. It says, do not open this envelope, at least not until I tell you. Um, and so, but I want, if, if you didn't get one of these for some reason, we have a few left and I want everybody to have one. So if, if you raise your hand, we'll make sure we get you one. Everybody in the house can have one. Um, and we got a couple right there. Charity, would you do me a favor? Would you pass this one back? Right there, there's a couple right there. And... Um, yeah, if, if you'd like it, you can have that, and then uh, we'll, we'll kind of come back around that, uh, around to that at the end of service. So I'm going to invite you all to stand. We're going to go to our text here in just a second. The other day, I, I ordered a coffee, which I do less of, I think, you know, going out, you know, for coffee these days, probably for this reason, because when I ordered the coffee and then I, you know, made a couple changes to it, the, the person at the point of sale, they were like, well, that'll be six eighty nine. And then there was like a long pause, awkward kind of silence while I waited for him to be like, just kidding. <laughs> but he was serious, right? I was like, wow, this is, a, this, this is why I'm not going out buying coffees like this anymore. Those, you know, like specialty drinks or whatever else, uh, because it was crazy. And you say, well, you know, what's the big deal? What's the... I think all of us are always paying attention to costs and to money in our lives because this is a, a, a very simple, maybe it's overly simple, but because money is, it represents the work of our hands. It represents the sweat, the anxious hours, the worrying about that presentation or having to do that work or showing up at this early hour. And, and when we give that we get money in exchange for it. And so when we start talking about money, people get a little bit like, Ugh, because you're really talking about my life. So we're going to talk today about taking care of your money. As a church, we have lots of opportunities and, and I'd say a few key ways where you can learn how to manage your money better. And we'll be offering those next steps. But I want to talk to you about what the Bible has to say about how we take care of our money. So 2 Corinthians chapter 8 starts out, and we, uh, uh, on the video there, we saw a piece of that, a, a part of this passage, but this is going to be our text for today. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he says this, remember a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. Not going to be pressure today. We're not taking an offering at the end of service, just so you know. Some of you guys are like, are they going to sneak one in there, at the, another one in at the end? Nope, no pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully and God will generously provide all you need. Then you'll always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they who share freely and give generously to the poor, their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you'll be enriched in every way so that you can always be 
generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. Lord, thank you for your word today. I pray that you would bless it to our hearts and let it be like a seed that would fall on good soil so that it would spring up, producing faith and obedience in our lives. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 You can be seated. On the gra- For those of you guys who are like, I didn't know you were going to talk about this, it's right there on the graphic, you guys. <laughs> we're giving you the heads up. I have four thoughts today that I want to share with you because I really believe that I want to get, to, get, get through this and get to this moment um, of, I think, insight for us uh, as we go out into our day-to-day. Sunday services for you and me, when we gather together, this is not meant to be the final word on what happens in our lives. As a church, our vision has never been, let's have great Sunday services. As a church, our vision has been, let's have gathering moments where the Holy Spirit can speak to hearts and catalyze and kind of like provoke us to make decisions so that our Monday to Saturday, we can spend worshiping and honoring God and being a blessing as God has called us to be in our world. So we're obviously talking today about taking care of our money. And in our text today, the Apostle Paul is addressing the Corinthian church saying, basically giving them instructions on how they are to give their money. So my first thought today is just this, giving starts with gratitude. It starts with gratitude. Before we ever get to giving, to that moment where we're going to, you know, share with somebody else or where we're going to give our money to some cause or to, or, 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 or bring our money in an offering to the church or something else like that. Before we ever get to that moment, giving starts with gratitude. It was, it was 2020 when I read this. It happened in the year 2020. It was an ABC News article that the, the headline was, Man Punches Great White Shark to Save Wife. You had me right there. You know? Of course, I knew right away this could happen nowhere else in the world except in Australia. Okay, because the Australians are crazy like that, right? But, the, but I actually, I went back and I watched it this week because it's still online. You can find it. it and they have video of the guy talking about, like, punching, getting on top of the great white, <laughs> punching the shark because it had a hold on his wife's leg, right? Okay, this is not a lie. This is, this is the real thing. But, but the best part about it was I'm imagining now. That was 2020. I'm imagining here in 2024 what, how often that still comes up. Because I'm imagining that every single argument that they have together ends this way. Yeah, but I punched a great white shark to save your life. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Like that, that's like one in the pot. Every time, man, you can take that out and be like, oh, yeah? You know, like what I, I punched a great white shark to save your life. You better be grateful. <laughs> And the thing is, I say that giving begins with gratefulness or gratitude because most of us, it doesn't come so natural for us to be grateful. Gratitude doesn't come all that natural. Consumer capitalism is a pro at two things, creating wealth. It does a good job of that, but it also creates a lot of envy, okay? Happiness, it's been said, is just results minus expectations, And what a lot of times what we have is we have these expectations that are so high that we are never grateful. We're never happy. We we don't don't practice gratitude in our lives because we're always unhappy with what we have. You know, you could say it like this. The hardest financial skill for a person to develop is to stop the goalposts from moving in their life. Like once I've reached this point, oh, oh, I want to get to this point. And once I want to, that's an incredible skill. That's an incredible gift to have. Because whenever I have enough, it seems like that's the moment that I just want more. Gratitude is the art of being present to God's goodness. It's so important when we talk about taking care of these gifts in our lives. The reason I keep calling it that is because stewardship actually begins with recognizing that these are gifts. Recognizing that I have to give thanks for this. Being eyes open to what God has given me. When we're thankful, we focus on what we've been given, 
instead of what we want. This is really important because what you'll, what you'll find in your life is that life is not always up and to the right. Okay? It's not always like an ever-increasing, you know, I'm getting better, I'm getting more. In every area of my life, it's, sometimes it's the expectation that we're going up and to the right, but it's not the reality, right? It's nice to think that we'll only get better with time. I had a friend in high school who took the ACT, right, and he scored a 25, and that wasn't good enough for him. So we went back, and he took the test again, and he scored a 23, and we were like, man, you got to stop taking that test. <laughs> it's just getting worse over time. And I think uh, th- this, is, this is a great picture of what happens in many of our lives. We think that just because we're getting older, just because we're moving ahead in time, that somehow we're just going to keep getting better. But what we find is sometimes we score lower on life's tests than we did yesterday. <laughs> we, look at, we look at the scoreboard, and, 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 and we're older, but then we find out that that we're farther behind than we were years ago. If that's not your story, you'll experience that at some point in your life because life makes a failure out of all of us. Hmm. Some of you guys are like, these are the encouraging words, Steve. <laughs> That's why old people go to church. I've said it before. That's why you find churches filled with old people because, because they've had enough time to rack up enough failures to see their own limitations on painful display that they realize, wait, I don't, it's not like I've got this. <laughs> I have to recognize the givenness, the goodness of God to bring gifts into my life. And, and I, I would think if church should be one thing, it should be a place not where we kind of hold up this up and to the right model of self-improvement, right? Where, but where we celebrate every week the cross of Christ. Because the cross of Christ literally declares my not enoughness. It literally is on, it's literally the symbol that says you are not enough. Because God had to send, God had to send his son to pay the price for my sins. I am not good enough. And the cross says that. And so church is the place, not where we come to get another self-improvement scheme, to, to get another idea of how we can be up and to the right. It's the place where we should be sure we can receive the enoughness of God. The cross declares, I'm not enough. My sweat and self my sweat and self-improvement is actually part of what brought me to this place of need. We are not enough, but he is. About five years ago, there was a 44-year-old man named George that was in court in New York City uh, for basically unpaid fines. He had over, say, he had over 500 overdue books at the New York Public Library, and with the, with the fine money compounded, he owed $31,000 and was facing jail time, right? It's like he, he had all these overdue books, and he was, this can only happen in New York, I think, anyway. Um, but, but here's the thing. This is what I want to bring up. Some of you here today have overdue gratitude. You, you're, you, you've you been drawing on this. You've, you've been drawing on this for a while. But and, and, and it's like God has been good and he's faithful and he's humble enough to continue to bless you when you don't say thank you. But your gratitude is overdue today. And before we ever talk about giving, we need to talk about gratitude. We need to talk about giving thanks to God for his good gifts in our lives. Can you say thank you to the Lord this morning? Thank you, Lord. Come on, give it up and praise God for every good thing that he's given to you. <laughs> giving starts with gratitude. Secondly, Money is meant for managing, not meaning. Jesus in his lifetime, in his ministry, told a lot, of, a lot of stories. They were parables. They were meant to illustrate a point about the kingdom of God. They were meant to give us insight into God's operating principles. Out of 29 or so parables that Jesus told, 16 of them dealt with money or resources or managing. I want you to, I want you to see that. Um, nearly two-thirds of, of every time he told one of these stories, it was about this topic of how we manage our money. Why? Why did Jesus know this was so significant? Because of what I shared at the beginning. Because Jesus knew that that money issue was really a heart and a life issue, right? So here he is addressing it over and over again. And I had this, I had this really simple 
revelation a few years ago when I was preparing for a sermon like this. And literally, some of you guys may be like, this is so obvious, Steve. But for whatever reason, it escaped me. In all of these stories that Jesus is telling about money, he's talking about somebody who's managing somebody else's stuff. It's always about somebody... Uh, you know, a, a, a man gave his, you know, uh, entrusted this to this person and he went away and he was supposed to manage it. And Jesus is telling these stories about how these people are managing somebody else's resources. And the message is really clear that Jesus is giving to us. We are managers, not owners. Whatever God has given to you, whatever gifts that we talk about, and last week we talked about take care of your body, that gift that he, you are a manager not an owner, right? Right. That's the way the Apostle Paul concluded in his first letter to the Corinthians. He says, listen, honor God with your body. God, honor. You don't own your body. You're just managing it. You don't own your money. You're just managing it. We were created and designed to hold something in trust for someone else and to cultivate it to flourishing. That's the design of, 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 of that's what it means to be human. We are wired to feel satisfied in stewardship. Okay, I want you to see that. Our best self, our best self, our redeemed self is deeply satisfied in stewarding something well. But here's what our worst self does. Sin, when it enters into our hearts, and it has in all of us to some extent, it's found its way, its roots are there in in my heart, in your heart. And what sin does, if we're not careful, is it makes us obsessed with owning instead of delighted with managing. If I realize that every good thing that's come to me is actually from the wise hand of God, and he's asking me to hold on to it for a time, then here's what I do. I know I can hold on to it loosely and purposefully. The generous hand of God has entrusted to you and to me all the resources and good things that in his wisdom he determined that we should manage. So here's the thing. If I am only managing a little, then this is what I, I, I want to be faithful with that, don't I? Even in the parable that Jesus told, the, 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 it, this is what the, the owner said to the manager. He says, you've been faithful with a little. Now I'm going to give you much. So whatever God has entrusted you to, uh, entrusted to you, that is to be managed wisely, knowing that if we're faithful with that, God will give us more. Here's the problem, though. Instead of managing money, a lot of people are trying to squeeze meaning from their money. Don't ask money to give you significance. It won't. Some of you guys say, oh, I know better than that. I know that it's not a thing. But let me ask you a couple questions. Do you sometimes feel better than someone else because you have more money than them? Do you think that because you have money that you're smarter than somebody else or maybe more valuable? Or let me ask you this question because this could go this way too. It could cut both ways. Here's the opposite question. Do you sometimes feel insignificant or less than because you don't have as much money as somebody else. Both of these are symptoms of us trying to squeeze meaning from money, right? You know, don't, don't ask money to give you significance or meaning. Don't ask it to give you security, right? Because maybe you're not wired in that way to look for the meaning, but you're, but you're wired to look for security in that money. And so you, you say, uh, this, this world is so uncontrollable and so unpredictable, and so I want to amass what I can to be able to hang on to this sense of security because if I need to, I can use my money to keep me safe. There is a degree of consistency that we should aim for, but that's different than control. Jesus said running after this, does not add a single minute to your life. Come on, let me say it again. Running after that does not add a single minute to your life. So money is meant for managing. It's not meant for meaning. 
Now, here's where we're going to get down to it. And the idea of this, once we've cleared this, the, these hurdles of saying, okay, now I understand gratitude, and I understand that this is a managing issue. I'm not an owner. I'm a manager. Then let me talk to you about one specific area where I believe we need to address and where we're going to talk. Two areas, actually. So before, guys, don't worry. Don't get some, we've got people on the, get their finger on the trigger there with the next slide. Don't worry. Hang on with the next slide because I want to talk about this. There are two main, I want to talk about two areas where you and I can express our giving and our gratitude here in this context. And the first one is in the tithe, and the second one is, in, is with offerings. So you'll note that sometimes we make this little distinction where, where in, in, when we're talking, we might say, for those of you who are bringing the Lord's tithes and your offerings, when we bring the Lord's tithes and our offerings, and we're saying it like that because these two are different things, and I want to talk about them separately. So we're going to address the first one here, and this is point number three, and you can put it up there. Tithing is a testimony. So we went through it, right? We said giving starts with gratitude. And then we're saying money is meant for managing, not for meaning, okay? And now we're saying tithing is a testimony. Tithe is a, is a word that literally just, just it, it's a transliteration basically uh, of a word that means tenth, so there is no confusion about this. When we talk about a tithe, we're talking about a tenth. And, and, and here at our church, I, I believe in the tithe. I'm, I'm a per, I don't think I need to necessarily believe in the tithe. I, I, I think there's some people who would say, well, you know, isn't that, old, isn't that Old Testament? It is Old Testament, but it's not law. It's actually pre-Mosaic law, and that's why I still think that it applies to us today. I believe in the tithe. I believe that that 10% is something that we, God calls us as managers to bring to the storehouse where we're fed. Now, just really simply, that just means that wherever God has rooted you in community and the church community that you're a part of, I believe that's where you bring your tithe. So I'm grateful when we have people visit our church from other churches. I'm thankful that you're here. We want to welcome you. We are all one global family in Christ. That's the truth. But I don't want your tithe. The place where you get fed regularly is the place where your tithe needs to go. That's the storehouse that you bring that to so that it can be shared and so that it can continue the work of God within that community. So when we talk about tithe, let me give it to you. I'm about to go deep. Everybody raise your hand if you say go. Everybody say, don't raise your hand. Just say this. Just tell me this. Just talk back to me. If you're ready, just say go deep. Go All right. The law of first use is, I think, a, a very relevant thing for us to talk about. When we want to understand the way the Bible is addressing something, we look at its first use. Rabbis did this all the time. This was a, a regular way of, of beginning to understand something in the Scripture. And if we go with the law of first use, the first time that we see the idea of a tithe in the Scripture is in Genesis 14. I'm going to read it to you. We're about to go deep. Okay. It says this, after Abram returned from his victory. Oh, yeah, let me, here's the context. Abram's nephew Lot has been captured. There's been some, there's been a bunch of kings who've been fighting each other. Abraham's nephew Lot kind of gets caught in the midst of this and all the middle of this. And, and Abram realizes, man, my, Lot's in trouble. And he gets 318 of his own men together. And he goes and he rescues Lot. And he experiences victory that these other kings didn't, right? So this is the context. And it says, after Abram returned from his victory, after Kedor Laomer and all his allies, right? So, so Abram, like, really routes all these other kings. It says the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of kings. And then Melchizedek, the king of Salem and a priest of God most high, brought Abram some bread and wine. And Melchizedek blessed Abram with this blessing. Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high who has defeated your enemies for you. Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. Now, the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give back my people who were captured, but you keep for yourself all the goods that you've recovered. Abram replied to the king of Sodom, I solemnly swear to the Lord God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, that I will not take so much as a single thread or sandal thong from what belongs to you. Otherwise, you might say, I'm the one who made Abram rich." Right there is the first 
example that we see of that tenth. It says that Abram gave to Melchizedek a tenth. Now you say this is kind of an obscure passage in the scripture, and I guess it is, except for that the New Testament writers come back around and key in on this in a major way. So that those people who are, those, those, those writers of the New Testament are looking at this and saying, hey, this first time that it came out, this is really significant what's happening. You say, Melchizedek blessed Abram. But we might ask the question, wait, wasn't Abram already blessed? I mean, he had the, the 300 guys with him already. He was rolling that deep with you know, people who were loyal to him. And now he had this victory. He had all this plunder. Wasn't he already blessed? He's literally carrying with him the wealth of his victory. But here's the key. Just because you're wealthy doesn't mean you're blessed. I don't want to be rich. I want to be blessed. Just because you're wealthy does not mean that you're blessed. You could... I, I, I love this because what I see happen with so many people, and I've seen it happen since the start of our church, where people who've decided and chosen to honor God by giving him his tithe, his tenth, I see, it's not like I'm talking up here like a, a you know, some of you guys are like, is this prosperity preaching? I mean, no and yes. I'm not saying that God's going to turn around and if you give a dollar, he'll give you 10. And if you give, you know, I'm not trying to say that. What I'm saying is that when we honor God with the tithe, we are blessed. And I've watched people decide to tithe and then if these other areas of their life start sprouting up with blessing and flourishing and all this begins to happen because God's favor rests in it because he says, you're a good manager, aren't you? I gave you something that belonged to me to see if you would manage it well. Melchizedek says, the most high God, creator of heaven and earth, he addresses him that way. Abram, I'm going to bless you in the name of the most high God, creative, creator of heaven and earth. And it's almost like a reminder right at that moment to Abram, like, hey, listen, just so you know, he is not only the possessor. Some translations would say the possessor of heaven and earth. He's not only the owner of heaven, he's also the owner of earth. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it and all those who dwell in it, it all belongs to him. And it's important that you and I recognize that. That's what Melchizedek was saying. I'm going to bless you in the name of the one who not only owns what's in heaven, but who owns everything here too. You say, well, wait a second. I've, I've got the, you know, I, I've got this house and I, you got, I got the lake house over there. I got the, and I got the, my name is on the, on the deed. My name is on the deed. But let me just tell you something. God's name is on the dirt. <laughs> He's like, I, I own the dirt that that house sits on. I own it all. You think that you got it, but God is the owner of heaven and earth. And when you tithe, it keeps ownership in perspective. I know who this belongs to. And I know where it came from. I know what my assignment is, and that's to steward it well. You and I were not designed or created to live a life independent from God. We weren't, we weren't, that's not how we're designed. We're designed to be partners. We're designed to live in partnership with God. And that's what happens when you and I enter into this relationship where we are acknowledging with our 10th that what God has given to us is to be stewarded and to be managed in his wisdom. So the king of Sodom comes out and he's a wicked king from a wicked city that was perpetuating a wicked system where the most vulnerable were trampled on. Okay? That's the, that's the word of judgment against Sodom. It was that the most vulnerable in Sodom were trampled upon. And, and we saw that, we see that in, in what we see about that city. And the king of Sodom says, hey, thank you, Abram. Thank you so much for winning this victory for me. I, I want you to keep this money. I'm going to give you this money. And, and just, I'll just take the people back. Abram, Abram says, I'm not, I'm not going to give you, I don't want to take a cent from you. That's what he says. Let it never be said. Because if I take something from you, he says, let it never be said that you are my source. Tithing is a testimony because when you tithe, you are aligning yourself with a superior source. You're saying, you know what? It's not my boss. It's not my business. It's not the market. It's not this. It's God who provides for me. And my tenth is the testimony that says, God is my source. I have a superior source. 
There are people who want to line up and get credit for the things that have happened in your life. And you should give honor where honor is due. The Bible says that. Give honor where honor is due. And so you should say, listen, you were a blessing to me. And you were a help to me. And you showed kindness to me. And I want to honor for you. I want to honor you for that. I want to say you were a help. You were a kindness. You were a blessing to me. But don't forget, God is my source. Watch this. Because if you didn't show the kindness, and if you didn't show the help, and if you didn't share the blessing, God would have found someone else to do it if it was his purpose and his will. He is our source. Come on. Here's what I want you to do. Turn. Just... Punch somebody near you and say, he is my source. Come on, punch somebody near you and say, he's my source. He is my source. And when you needed provision, God did it. When you needed a blessing, God did it. When you needed encouragement, God did it. Now, he might have used somebody else to get it done, but God did it. Everybody say it out loud. God did it. God did it. God did it. In Malachi 3... God says to his people, he says, you just test me in this. I I don't have time to go any deep. That was about as deep as we're going to get right now. Because he says, just just test me in this. God says, if you stop robbing me of what belongs to me, that's the tenth that he's talking about. If you stop robbing me and instead you bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, God says, just test me. I will just see if I don't bless you by filling up your storehouses with more than you can contain. He says, if you will do that, I will rebuke the devourer in your life. I will rebuke the one who comes to try and steal from you, to try and and undermine the blessings and the gifts that I've given to you, to try and cause those things to decay. He says, basically, I will rebuke the devourer if you'll just tithe. That's the test, God says. Just test me in this, and that's the test that leads to the testimony afterwards. Yes, God is faithful. I know this is hard for some of you because you're like, man, I can't. It is countercultural. It is upside down from the way a lot of uh, the way a lot of our culture is talking about. And some of you grew up in church where this was a rule, or you grew up in a church where they didn't manage their money well and they weren't faithful stewards in that way. And let me just tell you, this is this is hard because when we give, th- th- listen, what, what did you say? Abram gave a tenth to Melchizedek, and you say, well, didn't, wasn't he giving it to a, was he giving it to a man, or was he giving it to God? And the answer is, yes. He was giving it to a man, but God received it as a tithe to himself. And so you say, man, that's, that's, really, that's really tricky here, because you're ta- you're ta- you're, what you're really saying, Steve, is you're trying to talk to us about giving to God, but then in the end, you want us to give to the church. And I'm saying yes. Because when I tithe, when you tithe, we're giving it to a, 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 to a, to a group of people, right? But, we're, but God receives it as a gift to himself. Now, I've been faithful with what I was in charge and entrusted with. Now it's on them to be faithful with what has been entrusted to them. You understand? That's the way it's going to work. And so I'm not trying to say that there, I, I, I'm all about, our church operates in, in, in principles of accountability. We try and follow all the best practices, and I would even say, and then some. But the bottom line that we have to ask ourselves is, am I being faithful with what God has entrusted to me? That's my testimony. When I tithe, I'm saying, God is my source. Fourthly and lastly, you know, I had to have four points on the talk about money. You're like, I thought he was going to have three, but we have four. Generosity is a joy. Now, I've got little ones, and I, I, for those of you who have little ones, you're going to relate to this, but sharing can be a challenge. It's not just an internal struggle with the, with, you know, with the little ones, but you see it, it literally manifests as a physical challenge. When, you know, you say to one of our kids, Aria, I need you to share with your brother. And she's like, ugh. <laughs> no! I mean, it, it literally, it's like, it's like, it's just this weight that she's, the weight of having to share. 
And it is lit and I'm not even exaggerating, it is literally a 10 cent Happy Meal toy that is broken. I mean, it's actually broken. It doesn't even work the way it's supposed to, but they both want it, and it's just a physical challenge. It's a challenge to share. So we talked about giving the tithe, what belongs to God, back to God. But now the, on top of that, the Bible says that we have offerings that we bring. And this is the thing. This is where it gets good. This is where it gets joyful. Proverbs 3.27 says, Don't withhold good from those to whom it is due when it's in the power of your hand to do it. Tithing is that testimony that God is my source. But when I start to be generous in these ways by bringing offerings, by showing generosity to others, this now begins to cultivate in me the deepest joy. I think you start seeing purpose in this like you've never experienced before. And it is, it is literally undoing some of what has been taught to us from the time that we were young. Because we live in a me-centered world, we live in a me-centered society, and we got to get our me time, and we got to take care of me first, but me first doesn't always work, does it? You cannot be a me first mother, doesn't work. You cannot be a me first father and be a successful father. You say, I, well, I would like the baby, but I don't want the sleepless nights. Good luck. You cannot be a me first husband because a, a healthy marriage works when there are two people who are literally preferring each other. We're literally deciding to prefer the other person. That's how that, so let me just say, if you've been living in a me first mentality, here's, here is the secret behind all this. That's why as a pastor, I cannot not preach this message because when you start to give and start to practice generosity with your money, let me tell you what's going to happen. You're going to start, it's going to break something inside, that me first mentality inside of you that is in operation within your marriage or at work or wherever you are with friendships. And it's going to start to break that and you're going to find yourself being generous in all kinds of ways and in all kinds of contexts. You cannot have a harvest without the sacrifice. Just as I was reading our text this morning, uh, a, little, a little part of that jumped out at me that didn't while I was preparing this week where it says, um, it will produce a harvest of generosity in you. I, I love that. There is a harvest to be had, but it cannot happen without having an open hand. Before you can have a harvest, there has to be seed. And if we hold the seed in our hand and we don't let it go, then there is no harvest. Martin Luther said, I've held many things in my hands and lost them all, but whatever I have placed in God's hands that I still possess. Jesus would jump on that and say, listen, giving is not a money issue. Giving is a heart issue. Generosity doesn't have anything to do with how much money you have. It doesn't have anything to do, I'll say it again. Generosity has nothing to do with how much money you have. Generosity, it, it's easy to think that, man, if I just had more money, I'll be more generous. But I'd argue that, that when you have more money, it becomes tougher to give. At least that's the case with the rich young ruler in Luke 18 who comes to Jesus and says, I got it all. I'm a triple threat. I'm young. I'm, 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 uh, I'm wealthy and I'm a good guy. And Jesus says, good for you, buddy. Give everything you own to the poor and come follow me. And it says the young man went away sad because money had such a hold on him. He was wealthy. And it's, it's, it's like this. There's a simple law of physics that says the greater the mass, the greater the hold that that mass exerts. It's called gravity, right? And I think it applies to wealth. That when we, get, when we become wealthier, it actually becomes more difficult to, to be generous in that way. It has more of a hold on us. And so, listen, my best advice to you who have very little right now, the young adults who are like, man, I'm just starting out or I've still got school debt or whatever else, my best advice to you is start giving now. Be generous now. Don't think that when you get more money, when the checks get bigger and the, and the net worth begins to climb from a negative into a positive and, you know, you start finding, it's going to be harder at that point if you don't practice being generous now. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and you'll love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. 
And then he says this. You think he was talking about, I mean, if you grew up in church, you think he'd be talking, and you didn't know this verse, you think he'd be talking about like, you know, drugs or wild living, you know, the things that we talk. And he says, you can't serve both God and mammon, money, greed. You can't do both. So I, I want you to see that here today. Some of us are caught in this trap where there's this gravity that is pulling us in. And, and the, the Bible is literally saying, pointing us, giving us a pathway to be free. Giving us a pathway to find meaning as we honor God, as we, as, we, as we have a testimony, as we are generous, as we find joy in what God has, in being a conduit, in being a, a, a channel for God to bless others. And you'll find that it starts, it might start with money, but it happens in all other areas of our lives. And we're talking about getting free to be generous. And the joy is in the generosity. Psalm 126 says this. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying the seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. What is the psalmist saying? He's saying the joy, actually, he says, it's hard to, to, to let that seed go. It's hard to sow that. Those who go out weeping with that seed in their hands, oh, God, I'm just trusting you because this is, I know if I were to have this for myself and keep it for myself, it would satisfy me for today. But what I'm doing is I'm trusting you, God, that as I sow this, you're my source, and I'm going to come back, even though I go out with tears, I'm going to come back with rejoicing, with my arms filled with a harvest of generosity, so much more that you've given me that now I can share with others and provide for my own needs. Do you see how that works? This is how God wants to operate in your life. And nobody is coming after you today to make sure that you do it. It is literally between you and God. I believe that if you will honor God, and if you will just do as God's word says and put him to the test, you'll see this to be true in your life. So we did some things. As a church, we're regularly trying to help people who come to us who are in need. When there are needs that, that kind of arise in our congregation, we, we try and handle those with generosity and with wisdom. But in particular in this week, we said we want to, we wanna, as a church, we want to do something that, that, that kind of puts this into motion. And I'll say this, for when you give to New City, what we do is we set aside a tenth of, of every dollar. We set aside 10 cents out of every dollar that go, goes into our, a, a peace, our peace plan, which has to do with partnerships, education, arts, compassion, and enterprise. It has to do with things that are happening outside of our church or, or in, in, the, in, the, in the case of compassion areas in our community or within our community where we see a need that, you know, it's, it's not about just keeping the church operations going. It's, it's going out. So... We tithe basically off of everything you give. So this week, there were several single moms who had expenses for housing, for vehicle maintenance that we provided for. There was a young couple that had medical bills that had been coming up, you know, kind of stacking up that we also helped in a significant way. There is a couple who... One of them is recovering from a stroke. The other is a primary caretaker now because of that. And so th their work situation has changed. One of them is out of work. The other has had to change. And so we help them. There is a single woman recovering from a medical crisis because of a doctor's mistake that we said, hey, we want to help with some of these bills or some of this stuff. There are medical expenses for a family with a newborn and a child with special needs that we said, hey, we want to help you out and take care of those medical expenses. There's an older saint who needed car repairs in order to keep working. We kind of brokered that and made sure that that was happening and that we could get that done. This is what we're doing. All this, over $10,000 this week just to be able to say, hey, listen, we want to bless the people who are in need in our congregation because it's better to give than to get. And so we had some folks on our staff who were like, Energized, They were like, I'm making this call, and I'm telling them we're going to take care of it. Yep, let's go for it. We're going to do it. I'm like, yeah, th this is great. 
That's where the joy is at. The joy is in generosity. What if you saw the resources that God has given to you as, as, as literally like the ammunition for generosity? What if, it's, what if it's God wanting to bless you with joy for being able to help other people? Abraham, Abram comes to Melchizedek and he says this. I, just, I, 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 I debated on whether we go the whole sermon about tithe, and I was like, no, we've got to go a little bit broader than that. But I'm coming back around to it because Abram gives the tenth to Melchizedek. And then we don't hear from Melchizedek again. It's just the writer of Hebrews who comes around and talks about him later and says that Jesus is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. He had no, we don't know where Melchizedek came from except for that he was the king of Salem, which is the city that would ultimately be Jerusalem, right? Jerusalem, the city of peace. And here he is the prince of the, of the city of Salem, which is the prince of peace. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying, oh, this Jesus, he was right all, all up in there. And, and Abram, when he, when he brought his tenth to the prince of peace, it was the prince of peace who said, now, I'm going to bless you like that. But here's what Genesis 15 says. As soon as you get through with that interaction, it says, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision and said, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. Can I tell you what God would say to you about the blessing that he would give to us? He would say, yes, be generous. Yes, tithe, do the things. And yes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to provide for you. But don't forget, I am the reward at the end of all of this. God says, I am your very great reward. Right after that whole thing with tithing, God says, now, Abram, don't you forget, I am am your shield and your reward. He is our reward for generosity. When we're aligning ourselves with the character of the owner whom we serve, when we're aligning ourselves, when we're operating in the same spirit as the one whose resources we are managing, that's our reward. When we begin to see what, it, what it's like to live in synchronicity, in alignment with the owner of heaven and earth. That's our reward. Second Corinthians 8, 9 brings it all home for us. It says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Now, I know for a fact the Apostle Paul was not talking about money when he said that we become rich. What he was saying is, you cannot have that reward except through receiving the grace of Jesus who became poor so you could have that great reward. Every week at New City Church, we take a moment. And even though you say, oh, this is a sermon about money and giving and time, take care of your money. Listen. Everything in the scriptures is pointing back to this. Jesus, who became poor so that through his poverty, you might become rich. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads for a moment. Before we do the next thing that we've got planned here today, I'm going to ask if there's somebody here today and you say, you know what, this is, this is my first step here today. Before we talk about money, before we talk about giving, before we talk about resources, before we talk about any of that, I need to acknowledge that Jesus became poor so that I could be reconciled to my heavenly Father, so that I could become rich in the grace of God, so that I could have God as my great reward. And if you'd say that I need to take care of that today, I want you to raise your hand right where you are. I'm going to pray for you before we go any further in our service. We're going to pray together as a congregation. And if that's you, you say, I need to receive that grace of God, and I need to experience that richness that has been promised to me because Jesus became poor for my sake. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand, and we're going to pray. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Just hold that hand up. I'm only going to take a minute here to do this. Thank you. Just hold it up high so I can count them out here today. Thank you. I see three hands in the house. Anybody else? Hold it up high so I don't miss you. Four hands. You could put that down. We're going to pray together, and then I've got one more thing I want to do with you here, but this is the moment here. The greatest 
transfer of wealth in the history of the world happened when Jesus gave up his riches to become poor so that you and I could be rich like this. And these four who raised their hands and anybody else who would pray this prayer in your heart today, I believe this is a moment where you receive that, the riches from God, the riches of the grace of God in Christ. So everybody repeat after me who wants to be in on this moment today. Say this, dear Lord Jesus, I believe you were the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to. But you rose from the grave to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be made new. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, you raised your hand or you know you should have.